Welcome to this uh, Midday Mentors. I'm Richard Farrow from the APM Group, and today I'm delighted to have Tony Mann with me. I've known Tony for about a decade, and he is one of the most experienced facilitators I know, but I have no idea how he became <laughs> such an experienced facilitator. So welcome, Tony. Would you like to say a little bit about yourself and how you got into this profession of facilitation? Uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, yeah, I've been doing this thing called facilitation for quite a while, and it's still very difficult to explain to people what a facilitator is doing the two minute lift expl you know, explanation. You know, so what's your job? Well, and 40 minutes later, after going down and up and down in the lift, you might have got there. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's partly because when I when I started facilitating, I didn't even know I was doing it. Uh, I, I, I was working in a project engineering company as a training advisor and the ninth floor was where the project teams worked from and I was called up there one day and I met this project director who said listen into this and there were all these chemical and mechanical and whatever engineers giving a presentation that they were going to give the next day to a very very important client to win a contract and the presentations were appalling um, it was awful. It was just dreadful. And he looked at me and said, what are you going to do about it? And I thought, well, you know, sense, sense says, don't say anything, just say this is very difficult. So, and I said, well, I, it's not going to work like this, is it? And he said, no. And I changed the way we did this presentation. I, I suggested we did it as a discussion. And he said, the client won't accept that. And I sort of said, well, you, you can present then. And he went, all right, all right, we'll go with that. So we created this sort of environment where it became a little bit like you and me. It was a discussion and he would uh, propose something. They would suggest something. And then one of the engineers would dive in and say something which was related to their expertise. Um, and we practiced it a bit and they did it. And the, uh, the company came back, I'm told, a couple of days later and said, what an innovative way of presenting to us. And we won this 40 million pound contract. <laughs> so you started life then really as a troubleshooter with people who had this challenging yeah. problem. Yeah, but, 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 I, but I had no idea what I was discussing. I didn't, I knew I wasn't meant to get involved in the conversation. And eventually I worked out that I was facilitating. I mean, I learned that word sometime later. So I had a very exciting time working in that company, just being called up to problems. and you know the result it's the apmg the book the course um because i managed to codify what we were doing and hmm. so it all happened by that so i think not being formally introduced to it as we'd like to send you on a course initially not having somebody tell me this is what facilitation is was very helpful because i did it and learned from my mistakes and developed a methodology so and that's how i got into it they often say that practice makes perfect. So yes, if you applied that concept of facilitation, do you think you can ever get to be a perfect facilitator? Do you think that's always going to be you know, the next hmm. step forward? Because I would imagine that most facilitations where you're involved are very, very different. They may follow the same format, but depending on the characters, depending upon the issue, so it must always be a journey of discovery. Yeah, could you give some examples without naming any names of facilitations <laughs> you've been involved in that, that stick in your memory? Uh, you were lots, yes. So let's try and be. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was talking, I was doing a webinar in, for Poland the other month and I have never used this analogy before and it doesn't work very well in Poland because the number of people playing golf is about 14,000, not many. Um, but I, 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 I likened it to playing golf where you have you choose the clubs you put in your bag before the game. But you and you vaguely know the course, but it will be different every wherever your ball lands. The wind will be different. The ground will be different. The hole will be a different position. Everything is different every time. And that is exactly as you said, it's like facilitation. It is like that. So I think the key. Uh, and so let's take an example. And I, this is one of my most traumatic experiences. I was working with the NHS, um, and the 
task was something like to determine the the healthcare provision for those in the justice system and they were going to outsource it to private companies so they wanted to get it clear and so the key i think to good facilitation and to getting better and better is to be willing to in your own mind say what does de de determine mean what does justice mean what does healthcare mean who are the and if you can't answer those as somebody not involved in it then there's a problem and about 20 minutes into this workshop which was a day what to determine the the healthcare provision that's needed for those people in the justice system the whole day collapsed <laughs> it literally collapsed i'd been doing good format you know everyone's in groups discussing bits of it and putting things in post-its and it was all looking lovely and as i was walking around it was <laughs> And there was such anger and, and upset in the room and i realized that nobody had a clue what the justice system meant nobody had a clue what a person who the people in it were nobody had a clue what they meant by healthcare. did it mean somebody arrested by the police and put in the cells overnight has got toothache has got got to go and see a dentist did it mean somebody on license after they've left prison is in the healthcare system a long story short at the end of the day i went out and rushed downstairs got in a taxi and hoped i could just hide my way to the king's cross station and there's three others of the, the nhs got in the taxi with me and they they i kept my head down and they said <laughs> that, that was a great day tony and i said pardon and they said if you hadn't got us to identify the objective absolutely clearly we'd have spent months and months fighting and arguing and whatever and the people buying it buying into the contracts would either have had a free field to make zillions of money or would have just not known what to deliver so that's one example of the clarity of objective i was working in a food factory and apparently the swiss rolls weren't coming off the production line right and they were all arguing whose problem it was uh, certain certain lines were coming a little more fine and the others they weren't even couldn't put them in the boxes they were so out of shape and i went in a room with engineers supervisors production operatives um and we resolved the problem and i had not a clue how production worked but i knew i could hear the problem and i used a very well-known technique called is and is not which is it is happening on every on certain product lines i.e Cadbury Swiss rolls but no not on Cadbury's at somebody else's it isn't it is happening every day of the week they're on it isn't happening on any particular and we went through this and through this and they were going to be well where are we getting to and suddenly one of the engineers said I've got it and we solved the problem so getting better is about being willing always to listen to the issue and making sure the groups focus on that it's 80 percent of the facilitation is getting the right objective so would you say facilitation is a professional skill or would you say it's a life skill is it something you can that easily transfers from the boardroom the workshop the office into a discussion or trying to resolve something at a personal level uh funny enough i'm going to be using this uh some of the skills in a mentoring program i'm developing it won't be facilitating in its fullest sense with a capital f but the tools and techniques will be being used so i, I like the way it's the boardroom uh, operatives etc and is it a life skill or an organization skill because i think fundamentally and you and i have had this discussion way back when you said how long you've known me it's an organizational skill in the sense that it's designed to produce results in organizational situations project managers don't want to faff around finding out if the team feels comfortable and, and is having a nice time they want to get results they don't want to find that somebody at the end of the day says well that was a great team building event but we haven't gone any further so for me it's it's a, a a professional skill to be used in an organizational context but time and time again i've met people in airports on train stations in new companies or in the companies i've been in who walk down the corridor and say to me do you remember me and I go, uh, I'm not so sure. And they go, you facilitated that event where we were tackling X, Y, Z. And I go, oh, and I go, so what you, doing? oh, I'm a senior something, something, something now in the organization. And I go, oh, that's really great. Now, nah, you haven't asked me how I got here. And I go, okay, how'd you get here? 
by using my facilitation skill. Oh, really? And I go, what do you mean? And they go, I could be called on at any time, at any place to solve a problem that people have got by facilitating them. And that's what makes me so valuable to the business. So that must be hugely um, empowering for you. You must have a great sense of satisfaction when someone yeah. genuinely says, if it hadn't yeah. been for you, Tony, yeah. I wouldn't be what I am well, today. Yeah, yeah, it does sound like <laughs> that. And I try and turn it back to what you mean is, and they will actually say all the skills and they'll name the skills. They'll, sorry, they'll name the techniques and they'll name the skills and they'll name some of the process things that we do, I do. with. I always call it format, how you divide a room up and, and the tool and technique you're going to use. So if you're on the golf course, you're going to use a number seven iron, but you're going to use it halfway down the shaft and you're only going to use half a swing. Uh, you, it's the way that you use that club with the, you know, and so on. So that skill has, so, has, has made them very, very successful. And I remember being on a, actually on a boat. We were away on a way day with senior civil servants. And I'd been invited by this company to take away their newly trained facilitators to give them some experience. And so I put this newly trained facilitator who was getting good at it. I mean, he was already showing skill with a group of very senior civil servants. And at the end of the day, the senior civil servant came out to me and he said, very good, very good. I'm, I'm very impressed with you. And I said, oh, good. He said, no, 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 I'm very, very sharp, very sharp. And I said, oh, you might be interested. No, he's a supervisor on a bread line. Pardon? He said, I said, he works in food manufacturing. Really? I said, yes, he came out for some experience. Well, he was excellent. He's now a senior manager in a different sector. And he says, right. those skills have made, his, have become life skills and organizationally transferable skill. So facilitation, I think, is a skill, but it's also a, a function, a role, uh, a thing that should be embedded into organizations. You mentioned a couple of examples, but what was your most challenging facilitation? I mean, was it within company? Was it between organizations? You know, um, what <laughs> yeah, but my, my most challenging are failures. I failed, but I know now why I failed. No, there's no such thing as failure. There's just another right. step on the way to success. And I've been in a room with executives of an international, an international executive team from a foot, uh, from a for sport. So there's the executive people from a sport that's an international sport and an international uh, Olympic type sport. And we were trying to work out, they were trying to work out what was their best strategy. And within an hour, it became apparent that one half of the room believed that this sport or this activity was about engaging young people to use their bodies, to experiment, to explore, to find how to just be energized and use it as a sort of life experience. A bit like you might learn to play the piano, but never become a concert pianist. Yeah. Um, and the other set lot said, we've got to have concert pianists. We must win gold medals. And I found the room literally divided. And I, there was no way I could bring them together. There were two ideologies in the room. And you've probably seen some of the, those kind of discussions going on now uh, in the press about how, if one strategy wins over the other, mm. how devastating it can be. On the other hand, I was with this, these, but crusty, and I have to say, old men. So that makes me quite old. It was quite a while ago. <laughs> of, a, of, a, of a country who was involved in international and international sport, and I said to them, before we work any more, I was with a group of consultants. We need to know what are the key factors, the key drivers that are requiring you to that your the sport to change in your country. And they said, well, you're, you're going to tell us that. And, and we said, no, no, you are the people who know what's happening in that. So I said, and we got the old fashioned post-its out and I gave them all to them. And after a few minutes of sort of sitting there thinking, this is naff, they started getting up at the wall and we listened into them. And it was just a most beautiful discussion, listening to them mm -hmm. talking about their own sport. And they sat down and they looked at it and they said, that's it, we've got it, haven't we? Can you help us? Now that was challenging because it was about getting people to, to act. But the other one was impossible because it was an ideology, a philosophy that was impossible. So my greatest challenges have been when it's hardest to get people to come to a place. 
I can imagine. Tony, before we finish, what would be the top two two top tips that you would give to somebody who's just about to embark on their first real f facilitation? So they've done some training, they've had some coaching, they've had some mentoring, but now they're ready to <clears throat> to ride their bicycle without those stabilizers. So they're going into that room on the first day. What would be the two things you'd want really to focus on in terms of their own performance? Very often in a room, there's there's an ex, there's many experts who are all talking from their position of expertise. No, I can't really talk in expertise language. I'll pretend I'm uh, SAP. You know, well, as long as we've got the basic platform, we can additionally add on additional outsource software onto it, and and then we can make it a package. And it go on like that for three or four minutes, and everybody in the room is losing interest, and anyway has no idea. So one of the key skills I would say to a facilitator who's starting out is never, never be afraid to try themselves to feed back to what that what that person said. Now you mm -hmm. can't do it because you don't know what SAP is and you don't know what software in your, but you turn it into an analogy or something. Um, I remember doing it with one one company and I said, it seems to me what you're saying is a bit like a washing machine. As long as you put the right detergent and cleaning material in, you'll always be able to get it. But it may not come out on the first wash. You may have to do several washes. He said, you just defined how we clean petroleum. Yep. And I said, yes, because I'm I said, so have I understood you? And he said, exactly that. We and everybody on the room went, oh, right. <laughs> so be never afraid to risk the, the fact that you might be you're not an idiot because probably they don't understand either so yep. to say so john i think what you're saying is and he'll often go no that's not what i meant which means he's either not explained it or it's unexplainable or he'll go well that's sort of right and he'll correct it or he'll go that's absolutely right and if you can then start to get other people in the room to go so john are you saying and they take that responsibility it cures most of the problems in the room because you're starting from a platform of everybody understands. Excellent. And so the other and one is what I, th test? I think make sure the like I said about the NHS, make sure the objective is clear. Never be afraid to believe the objective is is not clear, because the moment it starts breaking down, actually you've already too late. You've missed the fact that justice isn't clear, person isn't clear, anywhere in the system isn't clear. And you have a right as a facilitator to say, you've got to get these words clear in your own mind. It's great talking to you. I think we could probably carry on all day with the stories that you had. <laughs> yeah, it's a fascinating career and you clearly have a lot to share and a lot to um, tell Thank people you. about. So many Thank thanks you. for spending the time and hopefully we'll catch up again. Thanks a lot. Bless you. Thank Bye, you. Tony. All right. Thank you. Bye bye.